Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to this morning's study. As we look to open the words that God would have us to study, should we ask for his guidance and his direction? Should we ask for his wisdom and for for him to enlighten our minds so that we might be able to consider more carefully that which he would have us to understand? Be with us now. Direct us in all things. So may we now bow before him in prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the many blessings that you have been providing. We ask now, Father, for your direction and your guidance. Help us and direct us so that which we study may enlighten us so that we may more properly consider the words that you would have us to understand. We thank you, Father, for this time that we may spend together in study. We ask now, Father, for your blessing for the watch care of your angels, and for the enlightenment of your Holy Spirit. Direct us now, be with us, we ask. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, we were continuing through several points of Daniel chapter 12 from what Uriah Smith had presented from 1868 through 1871. Now, there was a point that was brought out this last week in the Thursday study, when we were looking at different portions of the original publishment of the articles that became thoughts on the book of Daniel. When we looked at the article that was published on the 16th of May of 1871, there was a point that was made that this article was published on the 25th day of the second month of the biblical year 5916. Do you all, those that were here on Thursday, do you recall this? Mm -hmm. And the other point that was pointed out was that this also was interesting because it was the 25th day of the second month of the biblical year. It was the 25th day of the second month of the rabbinic year, a rabbinic year 5631, and the 25th day of the second month of the Islamic year of 1288. Now, as I have been looking and preparing for other studies, I was a bit surprised because when, when we look at the portion that was published for chapter 11, beginning with verse 17 and going from verses 17 to 20, that particular study published on the 24th of January of the same year, 1871, was published on the second day of the 11th month of the biblical year 5915. But it is also the second day of the 11th month of the rabbinic year and the second day of the 11th month of the Islamic year. It's an oddity because we do not know yet how often the rabbinic, Islamic, and biblical years would coincide with the same type of a a numbering situation. Yeah, well, the way that would work is every 32 years and seven months, the the rabbinic or the Islamic calendar comes around to to catch up. Um, so so you would say well every thirty two years and seven months. But but um, the biblical and rabbinic line up. I don't know how often. Um, I'd have to figure that out. But anyway, you're looking at. Probably, you know, one in every 70 years or more, more than that. So it doesn't happen very often. Well. Now there you got 211, which is, of course, uh, Stephen's birthday. But the the 225, that's, or was that 525 or 5? 252. 252. Right. That's May 16th, 1871. And then this Correct. one is so so that is the first study. That's the first study on Daniel twelve, yes. 
Okay, and then this one, what's what's the one that's 211? The one that's 211 is Daniel 11, 17 to 20. Okay, and it's in the same year? It's in the same year, and what's really odd about that, it's 112 days apart. Okay, that's interesting. And what was the one that was 49 days apart? What was that? Uh, that was the first study of Daniel chapter 12 to the second study of Daniel 12. Okay. Okay, so we're dealing here with, um, so this study starting in 1871, that's the study of Daniel or the study of Daniel 11 and begins in 1871? Daniel 11 and 12 were in 1871. Okay. When did he start the study on Daniel? 1868. And what was the date for that? Just a moment. If I have this correctly, and I believe that I do, third of, excuse me, this would have been 3rd of January of 1870, not 1868. And we had some... Um, 1870. And we had something with um, the date didn't match up properly. January. Well, let's see what we find. Hang on. Yeah. It's, so January 3rd, 1870. That's that's a Monday, uh, the 30th day of the ninth month on the biblical, first day of the 11th month on the rabbinic, and 30th day of the ninth month. On the Islamic. I'm looking at the documents right now okay. to see exactly. I know this may, you know, to people watching this seems kind of trivial, but uh, so the other one's 1871, and that's May 16th. Correct. And then you had you had a, a July date as well. Yes, 18th of July, 1871. 18th of July, 1871. Yes. So I thought we had a um a twelve hundred and ninety day span somewhere. I believe the original twelve ninety that we were addressing was from the beginning of the articles to the end of the articles and I'm looking right now. because yeah, we had a date of January fifth, eighteen sixty eight. Okay, just hang with me for a moment. It takes a moment to scroll through these. I've also noted as I go through these old review and heralds that I have to pay attention to the direct heading because what's normally on the following pages for dates can be an error more often than not. No. As in, especially when they change the year, the next several months, they don't update the year on the following pages. So they may be a bit behind. And I have to put no. that down to some of the, the situation that they would have with typesetting. Yeah. Well, maybe we should deal with this a bit later or something. Okay. I'll look, but, I, um, go ahead. Yeah. So there was a number of things, you know, from the yesterday, and I apologize for missing, but it uh, happens. Um, so, so we were discussing um, uh, Uriah Smith. Uh, with, we were dealing with the beginning of Daniel chapter 11 and the list of the kings. And there was a point being made regarding Miller, and I put a note in the video. So on the YouTube video, I have a note there. Okay. Um, so one is I put a note about the Mini Mini Tickle You Farson for anybody who's going to watch that video. And then uh, I put the special resurrection note as well. But Kelly did bring that up. Now, that, of course, is from the Great Controversy, and you looked at another verse. So you you were looking at the special resurrection, but that would be Daniel chapter 12, where he discusses the special resurrection. But then you were discussing, so which which what study were you actually um, looking at then yesterday? I believe it's this one right here. Okay, so that was chapter 12? Correct. We we had begun, because this was the portion from Smith's Review and Herald article, July 4th, 1871. 
Okay. And it covers strictly verse two. Okay. And why were we discussing the the list of the kings? Is chapter eleven? Because Smith, when we were when we were addressing this, had attempted in the first article to tie the list of the kings with Christ's taking up of the throne of the earth. Okay, so that's the overturn, overturn, overturn. Hang on, I'll go back to it. Yeah, well, he may not have addressed that. I, see, I didn't, I didn't follow it, but um, so the idea is that we know that we have, you know, you have Jehoiachin is the last uh, king before Zedekiah, and Zedekiah's his throne is going to be so Babylon takes over, right? At the time of Jehoiachin, Zedekiah, then it's overturned by Babylon. So it's Babylon takes it, then it's overturned to Medo Persia, overturned to Greece, overturned to Rome, and then Christ comes. But I, I didn't follow what was being said. Okay. I, really... I put this back up from the study yesterday. Smith wrote, we come now to the second question, what is the standing up of Michael? The key to the interpretation of the expression is furnished us in verses 2 and 3 of chapter 11. Okay. There shall stand up yet three kings in Persia. A mighty king shall stand up that shall reign with great dominion. There can be no doubt as to the meaning of these expressions in these instances. They mean to take the kingdom to reign. The same expression in the reverse under consideration must mean the same. At that oh, time, so he's just using this idea of standing up that Christ takes his kingdom. Correct. Okay. Now then why were we talking about the list of the kings? So, so I know William brought up um, William Miller's list, which is wrong. So William Miller doesn't put false murders in there. But I didn't understand the relevance of that in this this point. Sorry about that. Just... It's all right. Smith does put false smurtis in there. I believe yeah. he lists them as, as the second or third king. Well he's gonna he's gonna be the second. Because you got Cambyses, False Smurtis, um Darius, and then the third the fourth or richer than them all is Xerxes, and he had that correct. So, so I didn't. So there was this discussion regarding his dependence upon commentaries for that, or yes. Well, we depend upon commentaries for that too, because otherwise we would have no idea. I mean, we could read uh, Ezra and figure it out, but it's pretty difficult. Ellen White uh, gives us the same list. In studying Ezra. Yeah, the the direction that they were taking here, that we as we were having this discussion, mm -hmm. was that using the commentary of Bishop Newton, Smith wrote, the angel after sta stating where he stood in the first year of Darius to confirm and strengthen him, turns his attention to the future. Three kings shall yet stand up in Persia. To stand up means to reign. Three kings were to reign in Persia, referring doubtless to the immediate successors of Cyrus, that they were Cambyses, son of Cyrus, Smyrtus, an impostor, and Darius, Histapses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we would need a commentary in order to find that information. We wouldn't know that from the Bible. Okay, now, going back to your question mm -hmm. regarding the documents, the dates, etc., on the first publication on Smith's thoughts on Daniel. Mm -hmm. As I am currently on the Review and Herald site, mm -hmm. the Review and Herald on this claims that the article was published, as they say, on the third day January 5th, 1868. Now, yeah, so, and we know that the, the third day of the week, they mean Tuesday. Right, 
but it's actually a Sunday, January 5th, 1868. Okay, now here's here's the odd part of this. Mm -hmm. This document, while the publication shows 1868, is filed under the Review and Herald's for 1869. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, so if you go to 1869, um, January 5th is a Tuesday. So that's maybe the correct date. So what does that do to the numbers that we were we were addressing here? Well, it, it, it doesn't make it 1,290 days. It makes it 924. Okay. But we still have a 1290 being represented there with the incorrect date. Correct. <laughs> kind of an oddball situation, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. So interesting. Now, the other the other discussion that was being had was in regard um, to the special resurrection. Correct. So, so, so again, I was having a hard time. I don't know why. I, I was having a hard time following, watching the video. Um, now, so he's having this difficulty because of where he's placing close of probation and events after the close of probation. Correct. So, so he didn't appear to have it as the special resurrection. He had it as the general resurrection. He tried to separate. There's the, the resurrection of the righteous before the thousand years and the resurrection of the wicked after the thousand years. I think that's what I gathered from. Okay. Here, here is where we were at. I mm -hmm. put this document back up. So Smith asked the question, why may it not be the former or the resurrection which occurs at the last trump? Answer, because those who are then raised are all righteous. So his reference to verse 2, which reads, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Right. And then he's going to go through this linguistic thing, which makes no sense to me whatsoever, what he's saying about language. Right. Um, because, I mean, this is the special resurrection. This isn't referring to... Um, <laughs> I'm not. I, I I couldn't follow what he he was saying, so I don't know how you guys sorted it out. This is the part I think we got to right at the end of yesterday's meeting. Mm -hmm. I don't think we sorted. Maybe we can sort that out now. <laughs> anyway, I hope it's helpful me going through what I didn't understand for everyone else. Clarify different points, because he does say in all this Advent glory, a special resurrection, and answering the description here given. One of these, it must be for every declaration of scripture will be fulfilled. Anyway, so I, I wasn't sure whether he was supporting the special resurrection or not. That's, I guess, the point I was making. Well, Smith's statement, but the resurrection brought to view in the verse before us, 12.2, both righteous and wicked come up together. That's his premise. Oh, okay. So that, okay, so that is the special resurrection. So he does have it correct. So it says, it cannot therefore be the first resurrection, which includes the righteous only, nor the second, which is as distinctly confined to the wicked. If the text read, many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake to everlasting life, then the many might be interpreted as including all the righteous and the resurrection be that of the just at the second coming of Christ. But the fact that some of the many are wicked and rise to shame and everlasting contempt bars the way to such an application. Okay, and then he's going to try to use a linguistic argument, which doesn't make any sense to me. Right. Yeah, so I don't agree with his argument to support that. Okay, so he is saying it's a special resurrection. Okay, now, are, are we clear? Are, is everybody clear on that point now? Okay, there was quite a bit that Smith had to say here in his linguistic gymnastics that was, was a bit difficult to address, especially where he is going into different translations that we may or may not have available. 
here giving reference to the translation of Bush and Whiting. Mm -hmm. So we may wind up yet with other points that we would disagree with Uriah Smith. Well, it's just because that I that, think his his argument it, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, so that's the thing I found the most confusing is that I mean to say that you have to have um, I mean I mean I agree it's a special resurrection, but to say that somehow you have to have um, the sentence read that way, not, not everybody re reads it that way, and there's not any rule that says you have to read it that way. I mean, it says there, there's going to be a resurrection. It should be talking about the resurrection of the righteous before the thousand years and the resurrection of the wicked after the thousand years. There's nothing in a linguistic argument there. There's other reasons why we have this view of this, this being a resurrection. And, and that mostly has to do with the word many and some. So it's many and some. And we've looked at that before when we were studying it. Okay. Now, the paragraph that we were to address today mm -hmm. begins, is there any place for a special or limited resurrection or elsewhere any intimation of such an event before the Lord appears? Mm -hmm. The resurrection here predicted takes place when God's people are delivered from the great time of trouble with which the history of this world terminates. And it seems from Revelation 22.11 that this deliverance is given before the Lord appears. The awful, <laughs> the awful moment arrives when he that is filthy and unjust is pronounced unjust still. And he that is righteous and holy is pronounced holy still. Then the cases are all forever decided. And when this sentence is pronounced upon the righteous, it must be delivered to them. It must be deliverance to them. For then they are placed beyond all reach of danger or fear of evil. But the Lord has not yet made his appearance, for he immediately adds, and behold, I come quickly. The utterance of this solemn fiat, which seals the righteous to everlasting life and the wicked to eternal death, is supposed to be synchronous with the great voice which is heard from the throne in the temple of heaven saying, it is done. And this is evidently the voice of God so frequently alluded to in description of the scenes connected with the last day. Joel speaks of it and says, the Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem and the heavens and the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. The margin reads, instead of hope, place of repair or harbor. Then at this time, when God's voice is heard from heaven, just previous to the, to the coming of the Son of Man, God is a harbor for his people, or which is the same thing, provides them deliverance. Here then, at the voice of God, when the decisions of eternity are pronounced upon the race and the last stupendous scene is just about to open upon a doomed world, God gives to the astonished nations another evidence and pledge of his power and raises from the dead a multitude who have long slept in the dust of the earth. So he's asking the question regarding a special or limited re resurrection before the Lord appears. Mm -hmm. And he's answering he, it in the infer affirmative. Correct. Thus we see there is a time and place for the resurrection of Daniel 12 too. We now add a passage in the book of Revelation makes it necessary to suppose a resurrection of this kind to take place. Revelation 1 7 reads, Behold, he cometh with clouds. This is unquestionably the second advent, and every eye shall see him of the nations then living on the earth. And they also which pierced him, those who were actors in his crucifixion, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Those who crucified the Lord would, unless there was an exception made in their cases, 
remain in their graves till the end of the thousand years and come up in the general assembly of the wicked at that time. But here it is stated that they behold the Lord at his second advent. They must therefore have a special resurrection for that purpose. Yeah, these are these are the verses that I would have used rather than that linguistic argument. But he's using both. But uh, it's almost like he's using the linguistic gymnastics as a filler to make his article go a little longer. <laughs> well, I don't know. He probably thinks it's a good argument, but um, I don't think it is. But these are the reasons I would give the, those that uh, pierced Christ are going to see him coming in clouds. Okay. And it is certainly most appropriate that some eminent in holiness who have labored and suffered for their hope of a coming Savior but died without the sight should be raised a little before to witness the scenes attending his glorious epiphany as, in like manner, a goodly company come out of their graves after his resurrection to behold his risen glory and escort him in triumph to the right hand of the throne of the majesty on high and also that some eminent in wickedness who have done most to reproach the name of Christ and injure his cause and especially those who secured his cruel death upon the cross and mocked and derided him in his dying agonies should be raised as part of their judicial punishment to behold his return in the clouds of heaven, a celestial victor in to them unendurable majesty and splendor. Now I read this and I've got to ask a question. Is he saying that there's going to be two parts to the special resurrection? One where righteous and wicked are raised and then additionally some additional righteous are raised? I didn't or am I just that. No. Okay. He's just showing that there's the righteous and the wicked are both raised. So you've got these two classes and, and their reaction to it. So um so when he says here and, and it is certainly most appropriate that some eminent in holiness who have labored and suffered for their hope of the coming savior but died without the sight should be raised a little before, he means a little before the second coming, to witness the attending scenes, or the scenes attending his glorious epiphany. That's what he means by a little before. Okay, so I'm I'm highlighting the two portions that I'm questioning, because he seems okay. with this with this clause that he says to witness scenes attending his glorious epiphany, and then he's following it with this second statement. Yeah, but Am that, I that's talking about at the at the at the time when Christ was resurrected. So he's comparing okay. that that resurrection that happened when Christ was resurrected. Right. Okay. At, with what this special resurrection. Okay, so I stand corrected. Thank you. Okay. All right. One more remark upon this text before we leave it. It is supposed by some to furnish good evidence of the eternal conscious suffering of the wicked because those of this character who are spoken of come forth to shame and everlasting contempt. How can they suffer these, it is asked, unless they are conscious? It has already been stated that shame implies their consciousness. But it will be noticed that this is not said to be everlasting. This qualifying word is not inserted till we come to contempt which is an emotion felt by others toward the guilty parties and does not render necessary the consciousness of those against whom it is directed. And so some read the passage, some to shame and the everlasting contempt of their companions. And so it will be shame for their wickedness and corruption will burn into their very souls so long as they have this being. And when they pass away, consumed for their iniquities, their loathsome characters and their guilty deeds excite only contempt on the part of the righteous, unmodified and unabated, so long as they hold them in remembrance at all. The text, therefore, furnishes no proof of the eternal suffering of the wicked. Do we have any questions about that? Do we have any comments? 
Do we agree with Smith on, on his point? Yeah, I agree with him on that. Okay. Okay. We will go to this next document. Okay. Review and Herald, 11th of July of 1871. Beginning to cover verse 3 of chapter 12. Is this document before you now? Yes, it is. Okay. As the verse reads, and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and that they will turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Now, we've just seen verses and discussed verses that deal with resurrection. Is this verse dealing with resurrection, or is it dealing with something that goes on before the resurrection? Well, it's addressing the two different classes. Um, so I would say that this, this wouldn't just be about uh, the resurrection. So this would be before. So this is before the close of probation. Well, this is when the two classes are. It's discussing the two classes, right? So you have the close of probation. Um, and then it talks about the special resurrection. And then it goes back to the separation of the two classes. And the reason why it does that would be, uh, first, there's a close of probation, which is happening at that time. And, and the reason it discusses the special resurrection is that there, those two classes uh, allow the special resurrection to occur. So without the close of probation, you can't have the special resurrection. And then and here you're going to have um, this reference to uh, the, the the wise, right? So that's going to be the class that would have been, you know, let him that is righteous be righteous still. That's the way that I would take it. Now, how's my, my sound here? Like Do you hear dogs barking? You're, you're coming through all right. Okay. Do you hear dogs barking? Yes. Okay. That's no good. Okay. Okay, the verse or the the portion that Smith writes continues. The margin reads, teachers in place of wise. And they that be teachers shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. That is, of course, those who teach the truth and lead others to a knowledge of it. Just previous to the time when the events recorded in the foregoing verses are to be fulfilled. So tacitly, Smith is admitting that the Bible is not always in perfect chronological order. And as the world estimates loss and profit, it costs something to be teachers of these things in these days. It costs reputation, ease, comfort, and often property. It involves labors, crosses, sacrifices, loss of friendship, ridicule, and not unfrequently per persecution. And the question is often asked, how can you afford it? How can you afford to keep the Sabbath and perhaps lose a situation, reduce your income, or it may be even hazard your means of support? Oh, blind, deluded, sordid question, I make obedience to what God requires a matter of pecuniary consideration. How unlike is this to the noble martyrs who love not their lives to death? No, the affording is all on the other side. When God commands, we can afford, cannot afford to disobey. And if we are asked, how can you afford to keep the Sabbath? We have only to ask in reply, how can you afford not to do it? And in the coming day, when those who have sought to save their lives shall lose them, and those who have been willing to hazard all for the sake of truth and its divine Lord, shall receive the glorious reward promised in the next in the text and be raised up to shine as the firmament and the imperishable stars forever and ever. It will then seem be seen who have been wise and who, on the contrary, have made the choice of blindness and folly. The wicked and worldly now look upon Christians as fools and madmen and congratulate themselves upon their superior shrewdness in shunning what they call their folly and avoiding their losses. We need make no response for those who now order this decision 
will soon themselves reverse it, and that with terrible, though unavailing, earnestness. Here he jumps to to verse 10. The phraseology of verse 10 seems at first sight to be rather peculiar. Many shall be purified and made white and tried. How, it may be asked, can they be made white and then tried, as the language would seem to imply, when it is by being tried that they are purified and made white? Answer, the language doubtless describes a process which is many times repeated in the experience of those who, during this time, are being made ready for the coming and the kingdom of Lord. They are purified and made white to a certain degree. And in comparison with their former condition, they are tried. Greater tests are brought to bear upon them. If they endure these, the work of purification is thus carried on to a still deeper degree. The process of being made white is made to reach a still higher stage. And having reached this state, they are tried again, resulting in their being still further purified and made white. And thus the process goes on till characters are developed, which will stand the test of the great day, and a place is reached beyond which there is no need of further trial. Any thought or comment about his point here? Well, we had we had studied this um, because we had compared this uh, to the other verse in chapter 11 which was uh, 22 or something. So, so let me go, I just got to look it up. <clears throat> or 28. It's 35. 35, way over at 35. Okay. Oh, right. Yeah. So some of them of understanding shall fall to try them, to purge them, and to make them white. And we had noted that this is in a different order. So in chapter 12, uh, verse 10, many shall be purified, made white, and tried. So the other one has tried, purified, and made white, right? Try them, purge them, and make them white. So the question is, why are these in a different order? Why is the try put first? in Daniel 11, verse 35. And we, we had an argument that Daniel 11, verse 35 is referring to Millerite history to the three angels' messages, right? Right. Okay. So um, so in chapter 12, even though it's, it's referring to uh, the same idea, this is, this is not the same time period. This is our time period, correct? I would have to agree. Yeah. So the tried there, would that not refer to the time of Jacob's trouble? So you have these two classes after the close of probation. So this group has been purified, made white, and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly. That's going to be the fact that none of the wicked repent from their wickedness uh, when the plagues are being poured out. Does that make sense? Makes sense to me. Okay. So. So, I mean, that's that's an option. In the context here, because he's going to talk about the time of the end, but remember, we have two times of the end. So we have the time of the end in 1798, the time of the end in 1989. And then he's going to go back in verse 11 to the daily being taken away. Now, now why, is, why is he jumping to this verse all of a sudden? What was the reason for that? I missed that. Again, I was putting wood in the fire. So I I missed exactly why he switched to verse 10. He was trying to make a point to support verse 3. Yeah, but why? What's what's the point? Well. Can can you go back on the screen a little bit just so I can see what? There. Right, so he's going to be addressing particularly wise. Correct. I guess. Okay. Okay, so that does make sense. Why he why he refers to this? So that's going to be those after the close of probation. So that would agree with what I'm saying. That verse ten that that must agree 
that must be after the close of probation, not before. Well, the process could begin occurring before the close of probation, but it would, oh, yeah. it would end after. Yes. But that's why I'm saying the tribe is the time of Jacob's trouble. Right. Okay. So, so this would agree with what, what, what he's saying in his application of it. Okay. Go on. Okay. So here again, Smith is using linguistic gym, gymnastics to try to support some of his points. We recognize that verse 3 is referring to a period prior to the close of probation. The phraseology of verse 10 may also be related in that same manner. Because after probation is closed, how can those be purified? After probation is closed, why do they need to be tried? So it's just questions. To remove, to remove the earthliness. After probation is closed? That's what Ellen White says. After probation is closed. Mm-hmm. Where do we find that? It's in the Great Controversy. Okay. Um, I'll find it here. And I think it would also remind the saints of what Christ has gone through. You know, when he cried, Father, uh, why hast thou, thou forsaken me? Yeah. So this is a few different places. Um, but the one I was thinking actually is in uh, at least the wording that I was familiar with. Um, dealing with the time of Jacob's trouble. This is Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4. Chapter 34, The Time of Trouble, and this is um, uh, page 438. She says, yet Jacob's history is an assurance that God will not cast off those who have been deceived and tempted and betrayed into sin, but have returned unto him with true repentance. While Satan seeks to destroy this class, God will send his angels to comfort and protect them in the time of peril. The assaults of Satan are fierce and determined. His delusions are terrible. But the Lord's eye is upon his people, and his ear listens to their cries. Their affliction is great. The flames of the furnace seem about to consume them, but the refiner will bring forth as gold tried in the fire. God's love for his children during the period of their severest trial is as strong and tender as in the days of their sunniest prosperity. But it is needful for them to be placed in the furnace fire. Their earthiness must be removed, that the image of Christ may be perfectly reflected. So that's what she says in regard to the time of Jacob's trouble. All right. Now, continuing, verse 4. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Smith continues, the words in the book here spoken of doubtless refer to the things which had been revealed to Daniel in this prophecy. These things were to be shut up and sealed until the time of the end. That is, not to be specifically, specially studied or to any great extent understood until that time. The time of the end, as has already been shown, commenced in 1798. That's interesting to me because in studying some of the questions that were placed before Martin Luther, when he was being asked about situations having to do with the Antichrist, he was noting that many of those would be being revealed about 300 years hence from his time or in the 1800s. As the book was closed up and sealed at that time, the plain inference is that at that time or from that point, the book would be unsealed or people would have their attention specially called to this part of the inspired word. What has been done on the subject of prophecy since that time? It is unnecessary to remind the reader. The prophecies, especially Daniel's prophecy, has been under examination by all students of the word, whether civilization is spread abroad its light upon the earth. And so the remainder of this verse being a prediction of what should take place after the time of the end commenced, saying, 
Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Whether this running to and fro refers to the passing of people from place to place and the great improvements in the facilities for transportation and travel made within the last half century, or whether it means, as some understand it, a turning to and fro in the prophecies, that is, a diligent and earnest search, research into prophetic truth. The fulfillment is certainly and surely before our eyes. It must have its application in one of these two ways, and in both these directions, the present age is very strongly marked. Yeah, and we can say that it is a Hebrew idiom that refers to study. Okay. So in English, it you know it could refer people going back and forth, but but not in Hebrew. Um, now going back to sorry about the dog barking. Um, so going back to um, uh, what we were talking about earlier, what was the point? Um, uh, dealing with the 300 years you talked about with, with uh, Martin Luther. Right. Because I know that um, uh, we have we have something similar where, um, uh, was it Martin Luther? I always thought there was a statement re- by... Um, Isaac Newton in regard to placing the the 2300 days in the 1800s, but um, I'd have to find that. I could have been confusing the two, but we're confused. I didn't confuse them. Uh, Martin Luther, he uh, places the 1260 uh, beginning in 1800 and ending in 2060. So I don't know whether he's out there. I haven't heard him mention the 2,300 days, but that was his understanding of the 1260. You're, you're saying that uh, Isaac Newton used the 1260 to put that into the 1800s? Well, he had it beginning in the 800 AD when the Holy Roman Empire, you have Charlemagne uh, becoming the, the principal figure there. And that was that was his marking the beginning of the, the twelve sixty. So he used eight hundred AD to start the twelve sixty. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thanks for that, Stephen. Okay. Now, <clears throat> Smith continues. So, of the increase of knowledge, it must refer either to the increase of knowledge in general, the developments of the arts and sciences or an increase of knowledge in reference to those things revealed to Daniel, which were closed up and sealed to the time of the end. Here again, apply it which way we will. The fulfillment is most marked and complete. Look at the marvelous achievements of the human mind and the cunning works of men's hands, rivaling the magician's wildest dreams, which have been accomplished within the last 50 years. It was recently stated in the Scientific American that more advancement had been made in all scientific attainments and more progress in all that tends to domestic comfort, the rapid transaction of business among men and the transmission of intelligence from one to another than all that was done for 3,000 years previous put together. Would we agree with that? Scripturally, could we agree with that? Would we agree with Smith's statements or would we agree with Solomon's statement that there is nothing new under the sun. Well, I don't, I don't know if they'd be in conflict with each other. I mean, it's true that there has been all these advancements. I don't know if that's in conflict with the idea that there's nothing new under the sun, because that has to do with the fact that the basic principles are the same, even if uh, the externals are different. Okay. So he's just addressing this crease of knowledge as far as all of the other things that have happened, which which, I mean, we, we would definitely say there's an increase in knowledge, but I don't think that this knowledge is being increased and in, that here is referring to this type of knowledge. I believe it has to do with the knowledge of the scriptures. Secondary sense. Okay, Smith continues. Or on the other hand, look at the wonderful light which within the past 30 years has shown upon the scriptures. Now, given the point where he's writing this in 1871, he is referring to light that has come 
basically from 1841. The fulfillment of prophecy has been shown in the light of history. Applications are made which are beyond dispute, showing that the end of all things is near. Truly the seal has been taken from the book, and knowledge respecting what God has revealed in his word is wonderfully increased. We think it is in this respect that the prophecy is more than especially fulfilled. Then that we are in the time of the end when the book of this prophecy should no longer be sealed, but be opened and understood is shown by Revelation 10 verses 1 and 2, where a mighty angel is seen to come down from heaven with a little book in his hand open for proof that the little book there said to be open is the book here closed up and sealed and that the angel delivers his message in this generation. See thoughts on Revelation 10 verse 2. Now, we've stated many times that the little book would be Daniel 11, 40 to 45. Is Smith attempting to place Daniel 12 as part of Daniel 11, 40 to 45? When have we said that the little book is Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45? Isn't that what Elder Jeff presented many times? Well, in our history, but in this context, it would be the book of Daniel. The entire book of in, in, Revel, in Revelation 10, right? So so we have a repeat of history. And a repeat of history, we, we now look at it as Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. But that's just, that's just the application to our time. Because the Millerites are going to eat that book, right? And they're going to find it sweet in their mouth, but bitter in their belly. And we have the same message as well. That's going to be sweet in our mouth and bitter in our belly. Which means we have a disappointment, just like the Millerites did. So are we then placing this time frame that Smith is referring to and comparing it with Revelation, or excuse me, with Daniel eleven forty to forty five as a refinement, where the Millerite. Did you say refinement? Yeah. Wouldn't call it a refinement. I would just say it's just that we are repeating Millerite history. So in our history, the little book that's open just parallels the understanding of Daniel eleven verse forty to forty five because we now understand the time of the end in our history. So originally, the time of the end that it's referring to is 1798. In the repeat of history in our time of the end, then we would apply it to 1989. So that's what was opened in our time, is the understanding of Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. More specifically, uh, Daniel 11, verse 40b, right, that we have a time of the end that is a repeat of Millerite history. That's the whole basis of this movement, is that understanding. Okay. Now, Smith takes the next three verses and addresses them all in an omnibus fashion. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river, the other on that side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and a half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all of these things shall be finished. The question, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? undoubtedly has reference to all that has previously been mentioned, including the standing up of Michael, the time of trouble, the deliverance of God's people, and the special and antecedent resurrection of verse 1. And the answer seems to be given in two divisions. First, a specific prophetic period is marked off. And secondly, an indefinite period follows before the conclusion of all these things is reached. Just as we have it in chapter 8, 13, and 14, when the question was asked, how long the vision 
to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? The answer was a definite period of 2,300 days and then an indefinite period of cleansing of the sanctuary. So in the text before us, we have the period of a time, times and a half given, or 1,260 years, and then an indefinite period of a continuance of the scattering of the power of the holy people before consummation. How do we view this? So, so, so um, he, makes, he makes a common mistake that when we're dealing with chapter 8 verse 13 and 14 right and and i'm i'm kind of surprised he makes this mistake but the mistake is not understanding the 2520 right he's refused to understand what's that he's refused to understand the 2520 well i don't know if he's refused but he doesn't understand the 2520 that is he never understood at any time and and i don't think that that people were really understanding the 2520 in that period of time, definitely not. So what he's not understanding, if we go to um, Daniel chapter 8, right, and the question of how long, he's trying to say, well, the how long give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. Now, we know that um, we have, uh, we have, two things that are being talked about here, the sanctuary and the host. So I'm trying to go back to this here. Um, And and of course, we're going to address the daily and the taking away of the daily and the setting up of the abomination that make it desolate. So in Daniel chapter 8, it's going to talk about this little horn power. We know the little horn power that in verse 9, and out of one of them, one of the four winds, came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great, toward the south, toward the east, and toward the pleasant land. So we know that this is Rome, and it waxed great even to the host of heaven, and cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. So here uh, we have the host. So the sanctuary and the host will be trodden underfoot, right? That's what it's going to... uh, talk about. So he says, yea, he magnified himself against the prince of the host, it should say, and from him the daily was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. So this is this is the papacy. Um, uh, so first we have pagan Rome. He's going to be the one that magnifies himself against the prince of the host right? Christ. And then from him, that is pagan Rome, uh, the daily will be taken away and the place of his sanctuary cast down, referring to the city of Rome. And an host was given him against the daily by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground and it practiced and prospered, is a reference to um, uh, the papacy, right? So the papacy is the one that's going to, um, that host is given against the daily, right? So the hymn is a supplied word by reason of transgression. That is the abomination of desolation. And it casts down the truth to the ground and practiced and prospered. Then the question is, I heard one saint speaking and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, how long shall be the vision? We know that that vision, there is the chazon. So the vision has concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation, that is the abomination of desolation, to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. And then that's when the answer is unto me, 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So the sanctuary is not being um you know in in the answer to that question if we were going to take that in the way that the standardly is understood 2300 days would have to begin at the time in which the sanctuary has been trodden underfoot right you understand what i'm saying so people would have to start it either at the destruction of jerusalem or they'd have to study right 
you, you understand what I'm saying. But there's a specific point in which we start the 2300 days, and it's not going to be at the destruction of Jerusalem. No. If you say that this is the heavenly sanctuary, then you, you couldn't start that until the papacy comes. So this has always been the problem. Where do we start the 2300 days? And it's William Miller who came to the understanding that we have these two desolating powers, paganism and papalism. And with that understanding, we can then see that the 2300 days is a portion of the 2520. But he doesn't have that understanding. Smith does not. Does that make sense? Makes sense. So he's going to make the same error then in answer to this question about how long shall it be to the end of these wonders. And he's then going to say, well, this must be the 1260 days of papal supremacy. Right. That's that's what he's going to argue. Right. So he says, well, we have this these two divisions. First, there's this period given 1260 years and then this um, indefinite period which is the cleansing of the sanctuary. So he's going to have the 1260 years, and then an indefinite period of continuance of the scattering of the power of the holy people before the consummation. But that makes no sense because the scattering of the power of the holy people is the period that happens under the daily. And he, he there's no way that he can understand that if he doesn't understand the 2520. So what's can we see how the argument is faulty? What's that? What's the scattering the power of the holy people? Okay, so that's, that's the, the period that happens in the first 1260. So we have the trodden underfoot. So there is the power that treads underfoot is the papacy. When we, when we've gone through this study before in other times, but... Um, He's going to, you're going to see this in Revelation chapter uh, 11 when you go there, and it's going to talk about the 40 and two months, right? So it says yeah. um, in verse two, but the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot 40 and two months. So you'll see that the treading underfoot. And the stamping upon them, that's also going to be in um, in Daniel chapter 7, talking about that diverse beast that it stamps, right? Which would be the same as treading. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be the papal power that treads or stamps. But I'm just, my, but, my question was uh, more, more, what is that power of the holy people? Okay, so that, that is referring to the Jews. That, that has to do with their um, their kings. Right. So the power refers to, you know, um, uh, political power. Right. Because you, you have that with um, and, and that also connects us to Leviticus 26, the breaking of the pride of their power. Oh. So this would refer to the, yeah. to the kingdoms, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece and Rome that scatter God's people. Does that help? Yeah. Yeah. That connects the dots for me. Thank you. Right. Yeah. So the scattering of the power of the holy people cannot refer to the papal period. It has to refer to the pagan period of the 1260, or of the 2520, pardon me. So it's the 1260 pagan period, but it's the pagan period of the 2520, because there's the pagan and the papal. And 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 this, Ellen White never takes uh, this verse, verse 7, a time, times and a half of Daniel 12, and apply, applies it to the papacy. So if she thought it did apply to the papacy, she would have. It's sort of an argument from silence, but uh, she does refer to the other periods of 1260 that are mentioned and applies it, uh, um, and apply it to the papacy, but she doesn't with this verse. So so obviously she would not, not, since she doesn't ever do that, it allows us to see that it is applying to paganism. So the way that Daniel 12 works is it's addressing the whole purpose of Daniel 10, 11, and 12 is to teach Daniel about the 2520 because he already understands the 70 weeks. He had understanding of uh, the matter and he had understanding of the vision that is the vision of the evenings and mornings, the Mara. 
So he understood the 2300 days and he understood the 70 weeks. But now here in, in 10, 11, and 12, what's being addressed is the 2520. So he doesn't fully understand how that fits in. And the 2520, of course, is based on Phidicus 26. And, and he's been praying about this and trying to understand and put all these things together. So now here in verse 7 of Daniel chapter 12, he's being told that there's first this 1260 years. And then he's going to deal with the 1290 and the 1335 that are addressing the, the second half of the 2520. But it's not going to call it a period of 1260. It's going to be 1290 and 1335. And so there's a reason for that. We, we were discussing that before. Um, I think would have been like the last study that I uh, presented. So that would be whatever study number 205 or whatever it was. Okay, so hopefully that helps. A bit of review. Okay, so as we've gone a little bit over in today's study, we will look to finish this portion off tomorrow and then go on to the next segment of this on, on Daniel 12. Do we have any other comments or thoughts at this time? Uh, the only thing, so, so right now we're going through uh, Daniel 12. Are we going to go through his Daniel 10 and 11 as a review? That would be a lot of review. Well, are we just going to deal with the Daniel 12? I had I, I prepared most of what he has done on Daniel 11. I have nothing prepared at this point on Daniel 10 or on Daniel okay. 9. Yeah, well, definitely, we, I don't think we want to go through all of uh, Uriah Smith's book thoughts on no. 10. But but I do think it it is kind of, it would be a really good review. Like even going through this, um, to me, it's very helpful to sort of nail down what what we come, came to understand regarding this. Right. No, it, it, it's been a very effective review. Yeah. Yeah, now that I've figured out how to use my iPhone to connect uh, to Zoom, I think uh, it, it's a little, I was using the landline at first, and uh, that was really awkward. This is a little bit better. So I know I do lots of talking, but this is this is pretty important for what we're studying and how we're trying to understand this. Okay, thanks a lot, Dwight. You bet. Okay, so we will then close with prayer. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we've spent together, for the time that we have been able to study and consider these words that you have presented. Help us through this day. Direct us in all that you would have us to do so that your character and your name may be glorified. To this end, Father, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.